Greetings, nerdlings. Today, we're going to be talking about what happens at a synapse. So what happens when the impulse reaches the end of an axon? Where does it go? And how does it get conducted to the next axon and eventually the brain? At synapses. So the transmission of information between neurons occurs across what we call a synapse. A chemical synapse is a junction between two nerve cells consisting of a minute gap minute meaning very, very small, but the axon terminus of one cell does not directly touch the dendrites of the next, so we have to have a way of transferring that information. And we do so by means of impulses that get passed along by neurotransmitters. Neuro is referring to the nervous system, and transmitter is something that's going to transfer one thing from one end to the next. So we have different types of neurotransmitters, and these are chemical messengers. In most animals, transmission occurs at the synapses, and it involves messengers that are made out of chemicals, and those are called neurotransmitters. We have a couple of main groups of neurotransmitters. Those are acetylcholine, epinephrine, norepinephrine, dopamine, serotonin, and GABA. So this is a diagram showing how neurotransmitters work. The transfer of information that occurs at the synapse is a classical example of cell-to-cell -cell communication. The membrane is specifically adapted for this task. The synaptic knob membrane contains voltage-gated calcium channels. The postsynaptic membrane contains a receptor-bearing sodium channel, and the fluidity of the membrane allows for the fusion of vesicles. When I'm talking about presynaptic and postsynaptic, I'm talking about two different neurons. This would be the presynaptic neuron right here, so the one in which the message originated. So this would be the axon terminus of one, and this would be the dendrites of the next. So the presynaptic would be right here. Postsynaptic is when we're going into that second cell. Action potential depolarized the membrane of synaptic terminal. This triggers an influx of calcium ions. So you see this influx right here of calcium ions coming in. This causes the synaptic vesicles to fuse with the membrane of the presynaptic neuron. So right here, we have these vesicles that are fusing with this membrane right here. The vesicles release neurotransmitter molecules into the synaptic cleft and then the neurotransmitters will bind to the receptors of the ion channels embedded in the postsynaptic membrane. So they're going from one nerve cell to the next. So as a recap, we have the action potential which depolarized the membrane of the synaptic terminal. That triggered the influx of calcium. When this occurs, it causes the synaptic vesicle to fuse with the membrane of the presynaptic neuron, meaning that first neuron which the message got to the axon terminus. Then the vesicles release that neurotransmitter molecule into the synaptic cleft. Eventually, those neurotransmitters are going to bind to the receptors of the ion channels that are embedded in the postsynaptic membrane. So right here, we have calcium that stimulates the fusion of the neurotransmitter, so right here. These are bearing the vesicles to fuse with the presynaptic membrane to release the neurotransmitter into the synaptic cleft, which would be this right here. So this would be our synaptic cleft, this would be our presynaptic membrane, and this right here would be our postsynaptic membrane. The neurotransmitters will then be released into the cleft. So right here, we have them being released into the cleft. What I would like for you guys to do now is take some notes, make sure you watch this video clip, and pay very close attention to the information you are given in this. Our brains are constantly processing information, which requires communication between billions of nerve cells. Signals are passed from a sending neuron to a receiving neuron at a junction called a synapse. 
An action potential in the sending neuron travels down the axon until it reaches a synaptic terminal. The narrow gap between the synaptic terminal and the receiving neuron is called the synaptic cleft. The synaptic terminal of ascending neuron contains numerous vesicles filled with neurotransmitters, chemicals that carry information across the synaptic cleft. When an action potential reaches the synaptic terminal, the vesicles fuse with the plasma membrane of the sending neuron, releasing neurotransmitters into the synaptic cleft. The neurotransmitters affect the receiving neuron, changing the distribution of charge across its membrane. Let's take a closer look. An action potential is propagated down an axon by the opening and closing of sodium and potassium channels. When an action potential arrives at the synaptic terminal, it causes the opening of calcium channels, shown in green. Calcium ions enter the synaptic terminal through the calcium channels. Calcium ions bind to the vesicles containing neurotransmitters. This causes the vesicles to fuse with the plasma membrane of the sending neuron, releasing neurotransmitters into the synaptic cleft. The neurotransmitters diffuse across the synaptic cleft and bind to receptors in the plasma membrane of the receiving neuron. Here, the receptors are ion channels that open. Ions move across the membrane, changing the distribution of charge across the membrane. The neurotransmitters are quickly removed from the synaptic cleft, ending their effect on the receiving neuron. A single neuron can receive signals from many sending neurons. The signals arriving from the axon on the left are excitatory. They make the receiving neuron more likely to generate an action potential, as indicated by the green glows. Signals from the axon on the right are inhibitory, they make the receiving neuron less likely to generate an action potential, as indicated by the red glows. The two sets of signals cancel each other out, and no action potential is generated. Now, only excitatory signals are transmitted, and the receiving neuron generates an action potential down its axon. The signals that pass between these and countless other neurons constitute our thoughts and coordinate our activities. All right, so the neuron transmitter binds with the receptor on the postsynaptic membrane. So if you look right here, we have our neurotransmitter. It has bound to the receptor right here on the postsynaptic membrane. So it went from that presynaptic membrane from one neuron through the synapse to the next membrane or to the dendrites of the next cell, which we call the postsynaptic membrane. Once this neurotransmitter binds, it opens the sodium channels. This allows another action potential to occur, and the signal gets transmitted through that neuron to the next, to the next, to the next, until it eventually reaches the brain. So, exocytosis. This should bring you way back to when we covered cells. So, a neurotransmitter release is a form of exocytosis. Exo meaning outside, and cyto is referring to the cell. So in exocytosis, an internal vesicle will fuse with the membrane or the plasma membrane and it's going to secrete those macromolecules out of the cell. So as you can see here, we have a vesicle. It's traveling. It eventually binds to the plasma membrane and then it releases whatever is inside it. In this case, macromolecules or the neurotransmitters. The neurotransmitter will then be released from the postsynaptic membrane and it will be degraded. So it's basically going to disintegrate. There are more than a hundred neurotransmitters belonging to five main groups. We have acetylcholine, biogenic amines, amino acids, neuropeptides, and gases. A single neurotransmitter may have more than a dozen different receptors. So these are some of the main types of neurotransmitters. We have acetylcholine, and it can that affects our skeletal muscles. We have biogenic amines, the most common of those being norepinephrine, dopamine, and serotonin. Some are inhibitory, some are excitatory, 
and some are both. We have our amino acids. We have GABA, glycine, glutamate, and aspartate. The first two are inhibitory, meaning they are going to prevent a response from occurring. So they're going to stop that impulse from being sent from one nerve cell to the next. The aspartate is going to be excitatory. And we have our neuropeptides. Those are excitatory and the last one, metacephalin and endorphin, are generally inhibitory. Acetylcholine is a very common neurotransmitter in vertebrates and in invertebrates. Remember, vertebrates are animals that have a backbone and invertebrates do not. It is involved in muscle stimulation, memory formation, and learning. Invertebrates have two major classes of acetylcholine receptors. One that is a ligand gated and the other is a metabotropic, requiring a second messenger. Neurotransmitters are important in cell-to-cell -cell communication. One cell, the presynaptic one, communicates with the second cell, or the postsynaptic cell, through the release and actions of the neurotransmitters. Acetylcholine actually stimulates the contraction of skeletal muscles. Interestingly enough, it actually acts as an inhibitor to the cardiac muscle cell contraction, meaning that it inhibits the contraction of your heart. A metabotropic receptor is a type of membrane receptor of eukaryotic cells that acts through a second messenger. It may be located at the surface of the cell or in the vesicles. Right here, you see an image of the postsynaptic cleft as the sodium enters. Electrical is fast and cells are connected by the gap junctions, intracellular channels that allow the local ion currents of an action potential to throw between the neurons. In chemical, the narrow gap or synaptic cleft separates the neurons. A series of events converts the electrical signal of the action potential into a chemical signal that travels across the synapse. There, it is converted back to an electrical signal in the postsynaptic cell. So now we have a response. The transmission of information along the neurons and synapses results in an response. This response can be stimulatory or excitatory, or it could be inhibitory. So looking at this picture right here, everything in green is going to be excitatory. This means that it's going to get passed to the next synapse. So it's basically saying, yes, this is awesome, this needs to go to the brain, or we need to get this to the brain right away, it's very, very important. The inhibitory ones are shown in red, and those are basically saying, wait, stop, this does not need to get sent to the brain, don't send this signal any further. What I would like for you guys to do with this diagram is draw this into your journals. It does not have to be perfect, and I want you to go through and explain what's happening at each of these points. So make sure you explain what this is and why these two are kind of connected. You explain what's happening with the calcium, what this is doing, and you also explain the role of neurotransmitters. So make sure you take the time to do this. So I'm going to leave you with a question. If you injected ethylene glycol tetraacetic acid, which is a chelating agent that prevents calcium ions from moving across the membranes to a synaptic region, what would most likely happen? So think about it. We're no longer going to have those calcium ions moving across the membranes. If you said B, that it's going to decrease the release of the neurotransmitters by the presynaptic neuron, then you would be correct. I'll see you guys next time.